Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Alex Danoon. Um, we've got a lot to get through in this webinar. So if it's OK, I'm going to kick off now. I think additional people will inevitably join as we proceed. Uh, but um, I think we do need to try and race ahead. Um, so welcome to this joint presentation between Bristos and Aon. Uh, we're intending to address the recent MDCG guidance as regards cybersecurity for medical devices. We have a wealth of experience here today from both firms, uh, both Aon and Bristos. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, talk to you today on these topics. Um, my colleagues from Bristos, uh, Mark from our data team and, uh, and Charlie from the Com IT team. Um, and we'll be walking you through a particularly legal perspective on, uh, on these issues. Um, and the presenters from Aon. Uh, first, we have Matt. Uh, Matt leads the engagement management and R&D for Aon security testing practice in the EMEA. Uh, he, like each one of the other presenters, has more than 20 years relevant experience, and he brings a deep technical understanding to what is required to design, build, and break secure systems. Uh, Dan uh, is the head of R&D for Aon Cyber Solutions in the United States. As a leader in Aon security testing practice, he oversees testing of medical device, hardware, software, and related systems for organizations across the life sciences sector. And finally, we have Andrew Hainault. Andrew leads Aon security advisory practice in EMEA working with organizations to help build, deliver, and improve security programs. And he has particularly an in-depth consulting experience with a wide variety of sectors, which he's now beginning to focus on the life sciences sector. The slides will be available after the webinar. We've allowed some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So please do feel free to submit any questions you'd like to ask along the way, and we'll endeavor to address them in the webinar. There is a lot to get through, so I suspect we may struggle a little to answer all of the questions as we go, but please do submit them. And if we don't get time during the webinar, we'll try and find time to come back to it. Um, what we're primarily looking at is the MDCG guidance on cybersecurity. This guidance coincides with the greatest revolution to hit the medical device sector in three decades. The medical devices regulation and the in vitro diagnostic medical devices regulation, both of which are hitting at effectively the same time um, and are being compounded by the scarcity of notified bodies. Um, so this is going to be extraordinarily challenging time for people to try and get up to speed with cybersecurity. Um, while the guidance isn't legally binding, it will be treated as sacred text by both regulators and notified bodies for the foreseeable future, in part because neither the competent authorities nor the notified bodies have much familiarity with uh, cyber issues, let alone cybersecurity. So they will be clinging to this guidance uh, uh, like a wreckage in a storm. Um, while the guidance is pervasive and hugely demanding, and in fact, a never ending new obligation, the good news is that we can learn from our colleagues who are familiar with data, uh, IT um, uh, requirements and, and security requirements more generally, who've helped companies cope with GDPR and IT security more generally uh, to help us navigate through these very demanding requirements. To put it bluntly, very few uh, medical device companies whom I'm in regular contact are really ready to be able to deploy and satisfy all of these requirements today. And so trying to find a pathway forward is what we're going to try and explore in today's presentation. So if we can 
uh, I think if we hand across to the next slide, it will hand over to Aon to walk us through some of the scenarios that are that that the industry faces. Thank you. So uh, supply chain expectations and obligations feature quite heavily in the new regulation. And while I won't talk to the complexity of the device manufacturer supply chain, because as you can obviously see from uh, my diagram, it is complicated, but it's not the most complicated model I've, I've certainly come across. And, and having spent a number of years working in the automotive industry and, and working on uh, J3061, the guidelines for cybersecurity for cyber physical vehicle systems, managing a security, a cybersecurity governance program uh, with a, a complex a supply chain is challenging. And normally when we consider the supply chain, we don't normally think of the life cycle of the product. Now, as we move into a more hyper-connected service-driven world, we've got to change this perspective. And products and services may come with multiple involved parties, not only the retailer, but the manufacturer, the integrator, and, and even the communication service provider. So when it comes to risk management, a multi-pronged and multifaceted approach must be taken. There are some specific roles and expectations of all stakeholders, including manufacturers, suppliers, healthcare providers, patients, integrators, operators, and regulators. And all of these actors share responsibilities for ensuring a secured environment for the benefit of the patient safety. From a device development standpoint, the complexity of devices and the components mean a number of key challenges lay ahead for OEMs, in particular, understanding the software bill of materials, and being proactive with post-market surveillance, but also reactive through vigilance. And there are several examples over the recent years uh, of critical vulnerabilities discovered in low-level software, some of which uh, comes from uh, open source software that's caused great consternation with vendors. Uh, the first that I can recall is the Heartbleed vulnerability in 2014, and more recently, the GNU TLS vulnerability. Uh, and uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, uh, very recent um, uh, TCP IP communication stack vulnerability for embedded devices. Now, the complex nature of hardware and software supply chain can sometimes obfuscate the originating source of the software, leaving manufacturers open to, to known vulnerabilities. And uh, agreements uh, contemplating responsibility are one option to ensure that all parties understand the joint responsibility of managing devices in an IT uh, medical network, except how does this work when there isn't a commercial relationship such as using open source software? Now, couple this with the challenges around supplier patching, integration, uh, and distribution, a critical vulnerability could cause serious problems. And there's going to need to be an ongoing dialogue between healthcare providers and manufacturers to, to determine the need for uh, preventative or, or remedial action. Um, but there are lessons we can learn from other industries, um, such as the incident response around uh, the, the Jeep hack from, from a few years ago. And one of my own experiences uh, with automotive uh, was when law enforcement actually asked for some information on a component that was years out of date um, and was assisted by the OEM only to find that the company had morphed through acquisition and didn't have the relevant information any longer to support the investigation. And it's more likely that the information had been lost, but what would happen in this scenario uh, with a medical uh, a device manufacturer and the acquisition uh, of, a, of a supplier or even a bankruptcy uh, of a downstream supplier and, and how does that affect the support and maintenance of the product. And with obligations of establishing information security of a specific integrated device remaining with the healthcare provider, they should ensure that security is maintained during the operation of the medical device and in particular not compromised by changes uh, in the environment. And medical device manufacturers must also set out recommended uh, environmental security controls for the healthcare provider. And the medical device should be as autonomous as possible in terms of IT security and, and so reliance on existing uh, any uh, of, on the existence of any uh, IT security requirements on the operating environment should be kept to a minimum uh, and reflect the manufacturer's assumptions on the baseline of the uh, environment uh, environment and the uh, secure operation of the medical device. So during the risk management process, the manufacturer should foresee and evaluate uh, the potential exploitation of vulnerabilities. And that may result um, in uh, uh, 
uh, in uh, foreseeable uh, uh, misuse. Now, I haven't spent much time in healthcare provider networks, but if they're like any other industry verticals, then the ever moving target of medical device security uh, aligning with uh, healthcare provider security in order to keep, keep patients safe is, is going to be quite challenging. So there certainly is a lot of scope for foreseeable misuse here. Um, and one of the most common ways to uh, to enable this during the uh, during the, the manufacturing process is using a, a decades old practice uh, of threat modeling uh, where we define uh, components, flows, interactions and boundaries which can highlight the weaknesses in systems uh, and be used to uh, help develop compensating controls. And mature software development practices integrate this into the development lifecycle and in the context of this regulation form part of the risk assessment phase of not only uh, the development uh, portion, uh, but also during post market surveillance. But just to uh, wrap this up, um, uh, one final point, um, and uh, while medical professionals are responsible for uh, the use of the device for the right purpose, patients and consumers are encouraged to employ smart behavior. Now, not to denigrate users in any way, um, but this is going to be uh, challenging for uh, manufacturers to uh, to show uh, uh, the users of the system how to uh, how to how to behave accordingly. But just to uh, just to end in a summation, uh, you can see here that the, the, the landscape is actually quite complex. But what we're going to do now is that we're going to hand over to my colleague Dan and we're going to talk through uh, the threat landscape, some use cases and attack scenarios. Okay, uh, so I'm going to describe the threat landscape by walking through a couple of common attack scenarios that we see in the real world. <clears throat> uh, as part of Aon's security testing practice, we perform what is known as penetration testing. Uh, so this is a type of testing where we simulate what real world cyber attackers actually do. Uh, and this helps our clients prepare for uh, and defend against these types of attacks. So the way this works is we uh, go and we, we try to discover and actually exploit vulnerabilities in our clients' systems and devices and things like that uh, in a controlled fashion. And then we provide a detailed report at the end um, that explains you know, what we did and how we did it um, so that this stuff can be remediated. So the scenarios I'm going to describe are some of the types of attacks that we simulate that most commonly lead to compromise of medical devices and their associated networks. Something to keep in mind uh, is that the threat landscape is going to vary based on the technologies and the connectivity used by each device. Uh, network or cloud connected devices are going to have significant uh, additional risks and those need to be taken into account. So that's really what we're going to focus on here. The first scenario begins with a phishing attack. So for those who aren't familiar, phishing is when an attacker sends a malicious email to a target uh, that pur uh, purports to be a legitimate email. The goal is to try to trick the user into performing some kind of action that will ultimately uh, permit the attacker to access a uh, protected or sensitive system. Most of these types of attacks aren't targeted. Uh, they're usually looking to obtain credentials to things like banking uh, systems or financial services and things like that. Uh, but targeted attacks, which are referred to as spear phishing, uh, are becoming increasingly common, and they can be directed specifically at staff or employees that may have access to sensitive systems. Uh, in our experience, a well-crafted phishing attack that appears convincing has a pretty good chance of success, and it's actually the most common way that we're able to gain an initial foothold into our clients' networks when we're doing uh, penetration testing. We also found that uh, organizations are often not capable of adequately responding or recovering quickly enough to contain the threat, uh, which allows us, or an actual attacker, uh, plenty of time to dig deeper into the network and compromise devices, sensitive systems, et cetera. So step one in the scenario here uh, is that a member of healthcare staff is gonna receive a phishing email. They are convinced, uh, you know, they're successfully tricked. So they go and they click on a malicious link or they open a malicious attachment. And as a result, their system gets infected with malware. Uh, the malware can be, you know, off the shelf kind of stuff that's common, or it can be custom designed and very targeted, you know, to evade antivirus and other security measures. Uh, it can also have wide ranging, wide -ranging functionality, um, such as the ability to spread throughout the network by uh, exploiting vulnerabilities or just finding unprotected internal systems. Uh, 
Uh, and it can also include various payloads that perform different malicious actions depending on what type of environment it encounters, um, including the ability to reach out and download additional payloads um, from a command and control server, kind of based on you know, the environment that it encounters. <clears throat> so in this scenario, uh, the malware performs some initial reconnaissance, downloads a second piece of malware, um, which is gonna be ransomware. Uh, it then traverses the network and starts encrypting data, encrypting devices, uh, basically rendering them useless until ransom gets paid. So as we show here, uh, the malware can spread not only to, to uh, client systems and servers and databases, but it can also spread to medical devices themselves, such as diagnostic equipment or even devices that are providing critical patient care. Our uh, incident response practice within Aon has seen a dramatic rise in ransomware uh, over the recent, uh, well, couple of years, uh, including definitely in the healthcare industry. This is largely due to the growth of cryptocurrency, uh, which allows these attackers to earn money for systems that they compromise by holding them hostage until the victims send them Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Uh, many organizations feel that they don't have a choice but to pay these ransoms to get their systems up and running quickly. And that can especially be true in the uh, healthcare space when literally lives could be on the line. Um, authorities are also found it very difficult to uh, trace and, and uh, you know, apprehend the perpetrators of the, these types of attacks. Um, and so it, it's sort of become a very lucrative and very attractive target for, for these types of attackers. Um, <clears throat> so there have been many examples uh, of this happening in the healthcare industry around the world, uh, including several US hospitals um, and hospital networks that were taken offline and were even forced to use paper records uh, until their systems could be restored. Uh, and then as recently as May of this year, the largest private hospital operator in Europe suffered a ransomware attack that affected its systems across the globe. So if we can move on to the next slide. So in this scenario, uh, the attack vector targets backend network infrastructure rather than a, uh, an employee directly. So this is something like uh, exploitation of a vulnerability in an internet exposed network service, something like a third party data aggregation platform, uh, support system, something like a control panel or a dashboard that's used by the medical devices on the hospital network, uh, or a system that's used to transmit software updates or configuration updates to medical devices that are deployed in the field. Once a system like this is compromised, uh, it can be commandeered and then used to send malware over the network to attack the devices that it's normally communicating with. These attacks can also le uh, leverage ransomware. Uh, which again is going to render the devices and the systems unable to perform their functions and potentially compromise patient care. Uh, there was a real world or a good real world example of this demonstrated uh, in 2018 by a couple of security researchers that took a look at a pacemaker system and the network infrastructure that supported it. They discovered vulnerabilities in the software delivery network that is used to deliver software updates to the pacemaker programmer devices. Uh, these devices are used by the health professionals to configure the actual pacemakers and you know, tune the parameters for each specific patient. Uh, so by compromising the delivery system, it was shown that they were able to deliver a malicious software update to the pacemaker programmer. And then because the pacemaker programmer is compromised, uh, they could then jump from there and control the actual pacemakers that are implanted in patients. Uh, and this obviously is gonna you know, potentially cause serious harm or even death. Um, so another scenario worth mentioning uh, that we don't have a slide for, but just briefly, um, is you know attacks can also be directly uh, targeted at devices uh, using wireless networking if you're nearby or in proximity. Uh, so this same group of researchers demonstrated that they are able to cause an insulin pump that was nearby within wireless range to deliver the wrong amount of insulin. Um, this is again potentially life-threatening situation. So. What does this mean for device manufacturers? Uh, in the contents of the regulations that we're discussing here, there's a couple of key points. Uh, the main one is the concept of the reasonably foreseeable misuse. Um, according to these regulations, medical device manufacturers are responsible for ensuring that their devices are manufactured and designed in a way that the risks associated with reasonably foreseeable misuse are removed or minimized. So the regulations, they do recognize that software development is inherently complex 
And thus it's likely that most products are gonna contain cybersecurity vulnerabilities. However, they go on to say that the general assumption is that any vulnerability which is deemed to be exploitable for a given implementation of software might be discovered and exploited over time. And as such, should be regarded as an enabler for a reasonably foreseeable misuse. So in the example scenarios are described, uh, the connected devices had a path that led to compromise of the devices. Uh, so that would be considered foreseeable misuse. So what that means, you know, uh, sort of in summary, is that the device manufacturers are responsible for finding and fixing these vulnerabilities in their devices and the supporting systems before the bad guys do. So one of the ways that this can be accomplished uh, is through a program of regular, regular uh, security architecture reviews, penetration testing, source code reviews uh, by competent practitioners to discover these vulnerabilities proactively. Um, should also include things like you know having robust measures that allow any of these kind of vulnerabilities that are discovered to be rapidly mitigated, uh, fixes to be deployed to devices in the field through uh, live update mechanisms and things of that nature. Uh, in addition to vulnerabilities that within the device itself, uh, vulnerabilities could be introduced by the environment that the device operates in, so that needs to be considered as well. Um, and so we recommend doing things like post-market evaluations and surveillance of the environment. So, you know, perform an end-to-end -end test of the complete picture uh, of the device in the environment that it's actually going to be in. Uh, in cases where the devices integrate with third-party systems or networks, care has to be taken to make sure that the devices are hardened and designed in a way to proactively mitigate against any vulnerabilities that might be introduced um, just by the nature of operating or interoperating with these third-party systems uh, that are potentially, you know, compromised or hostile. So additional security measures should be taken to, you know, deal with unforeseen uh, vulnerabilities and, and things of that nature that might be outside of the manufacturer's control. Uh, last thing I'll say on this topic, um, we also recommend having policies and procedures in place uh, to accept good faith vulnerability reports that come from security researchers and other members of the public. Um, having procedures that are you know, ready to, to deal with this kind of thing and, and rapidly respond to this stuff can be extremely helpful um, and also help to avoid any kind of negative publicity that might arise um, you know, if the researcher decides to go public because they feel like they aren't being taken seriously. So having a policy set up to, to handle that kind of situation proactively uh, is, is a good thing to do as well. Thank you very much, Dan. The legal issues on the agenda, the Bristos team asked ourselves just one question, which is what do we think are the contractual implications of, of the MDCG guidance on cybersecurity? It, it's curiously coy uh, about contractual issues and, and doesn't have very much to say about it. Um, we have um, some ideas about why that might be, their hypotheses, of course, but, but I think perhaps the regulator's understanding of the contractual arrangements between the parties is, is, is probably uh, the most obvious culprit. Um, it's, it's a little bit rudimentary in our view, and, and you'll see as we go through the, the, the next um, few minutes why, why we think that. So we asked ourselves that question, what are the contractual implications of, of the guidance that we can tease out? And we looked at that through the lens of the sort of technology contracting that, that Charlie and I at Bristow's spend a lot of our time doing. Uh, and you'll see I've put in brackets uh, and even potentially what might we be able to learn from uh, GDPR. Um, that was obviously a, a, a sizable project for all sorts of companies in and outside this sector. Certainly not uh, quite the revolution that Alex was describing earlier um, about medical devices regulation generally, um, and this regulation being the largest in the last three decades. Um, so next slide, please. If, if we just start with the concept at the top of, of joint responsibility, that, that's helpful groundwork for the manufacturers. Um, and it's notable that the medical um, device coordination group refers to joint responsibility, whereas the, the, the international um, group, the IMDRF guidance, which came out um, later in the spring, 
has very much stuck with the concept of shared responsibility. We actually think shared responsibility is more legal, legally accurate. It's, it's shared, not necessarily equally, amongst the participants. Um, joint responsibility um, m might suggest that it's a legal construct in the sense of joint and several liability, perhaps, but, but, it, but it isn't that. What, what was perhaps most surprising to us um, in the guidance was how it goes on to say in the section on basic cybersecurity concepts. So section two of the guidance under the heading of joint responsibility, it says agreements amongst the parties to ensure a proper understanding of these responsibilities and their allocation amongst the parties are, are one option for addressing those joint responsibilities. Now, of course, Matt uh, from Aon um, mentioned the open source example where there may potentially not be a contractual nexus between the parties, though there will in fact usually be, be a license even in an open source context. Um, but Alex and Charlie and I did a straw poll amongst ourselves, well, what, what other options are there? Um, I think Alex, it was you who came up with telepathy. Um, but short of that, agreements are probably the only effective option for the parties to um, allocate responsibility amongst themselves. So we think there's going to be flow down of new obligations from manufacturers through the supply chain, um, to some extent upstream, but the guidance is almost silent on, on, on that, uh, and certainly downstream where the guidance has a bit more to say. Um, so what sort of new contractual provisions are going to be needed? We've put those under that second heading in orange, um, and, and broadly the first two of those bullet points tell you the we, we've divided them into, into um, two broad categories. The, the first one, what we call the sort of minimum cyber security requirements in the operating environment. Those are relatively clear in the guidance, although it's also clear that these are indicative and very context specific. So for example, the penetration testing of the sort that um, Dan from Aon was just telling us about will be highly likely already to pull form part of any manufacturer's quality management system. Um, but there are a number of, of requirements peppered throughout the guidance, and in particular, we would draw your attention to the, the table with examples on, on pages 36 to 38 of the guidance. That side of it is, is relatively clearly set out. Um, the second source of contractual obligation which we think the guidance prompts and which is much less clearly set out is um, all to do with post-market surveillance and, and vigilance obligations. And, and specifically, the fact that those are continuing obligations. There's a continuous obligation on the manufacturer um, uh, to undertake that surveillance. Um, so at that point, it, it's a typical challenge to say, fine, but why don't we just have provisions to comply with applicable law, or for that matter, why don't we just have, in, if that doesn't work for some reason, provisions in addition to comply with the MDCG guidance on cybersecurity in that case. That, that will just sort of cut through a lot of this complexity of, of having to try and um, provide for all these issues. Um, the short answer, of course, is, is one to do with enforceability, and, and all the lawyers in the audience will understand what I'm getting at. Where you have principles-based guidance uh, as opposed to detailed pres prescriptive rules, um, you aren't actually setting out anything more than a framework for how to think about your risk assessment, the sorts of issues that you need to be um, um, providing for, but not actually the steps themselves. Um, if that argument isn't good enough for you, then Perhaps the other way to think about it is the regulator's approach. Um, Alex mentioned it at the outset and the, the, the way in which they will be likely, in, in our view, to cling to this guidance, for want of a better word, owing to their relative lack of experience in, in the field of cyber security, I mean. Um, there is a marked emphasis on documentation throughout uh, the guidance. Uh, we'll touch on that below. Um, and so the regulators are going to be looking for a demonstration of compliance and a big emphasis on documenting. Uh, and therefore, 
they're going to be looking for something more detailed than than a tiny contractual provision of, of the sort um, uh, that I've just described that comply with applicable law or applicable guidance type of type of approach. So in short order, our conclusions are that the quality agreements and um, certainly the um, instructions for use documentation it is, is, is going to need some serious revision. It's likely to reopen commercial issues as a result of that. Um, and then finally, uh, a question from us. Um, GDPR threw up some similar issues to this, didn't it? Um, uh, and we survived, or, or perhaps more pertinently, um, we were able to distinguish effective programs from, from ineffective ones. I'll say more about that in a minute, but first, uh, over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Mark. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, if contracts are the answer to the question of how to implement the new obligations, how should manufacturers be going about this, and which other stakeholders should be involved? Our thinking on who should be involved, both upstream and downstream from the manufacturer, is set out in the slide here. As Mark mentioned, it seems to us that the guidance could have been more explicit about the role of upstream suppliers and service providers. Our view is that they are in the scope, not only in terms of obligations to ensure that goods and services are provided in such a way that the manufacturer can satisfy its cybersecurity obligations, but also by notifying vulnerabilities for post-market surveillance purposes. Another important stakeholder that the guidance refers to in passing are vendors of third-party software or hardware components of the device. And it doesn't refer in any meaningful way to third-party service providers, which may be providing related services to the device. But surely these should also be in scope. The obvious example being cloud service providers. If you are a manufacturer with a significant third-party component in your device, you might want to ask some questions of your contract with the third party vendor in light of the guidance. Is the vendor obliged to patch any security issues you identify in their products or services? If so, how quickly? Is the vendor required to provide you with usage data for post-market surveillance purposes? Both these issues are raised in the guidance and may not be addressed in your current contract. In terms of how to go about flowing both the minimum IT requirements and also the new PMS obligations through the supply chain, it seems to us that a slightly different approach is required for each. For the minimum IT requirements, a logical approach would be to create a master description or specification that acts as a single source of truth and point of reference, and which can then be reproduced whenever needed, for example in the IFU and in contracts with operators and other stakeholders. For the new cybersecurity PMS obligations, our view, our view is that the path of least resistance is to amend your quality agreements, given that these are the most common means of flowing regulatory compliance obligations through the supply chain. Either you could include a new cybersecurity section in your existing quality agreements, or create a new cybersecurity quality agreement, which would be akin to the cybersecurity schedules often found in, techno in technology agreements and outsourcing agreements. I'd make a couple of general comments as well. Firstly, clear allocation of responsibility as to who is going to be doing what will be even more important than usual. In the context of GDPR, this is a critical point for processes who can reduce their potential risk exposure by ensuring that the boundary between their security responsibilities and those of the controller is clearly delineated. I'd expect to see a similar pattern here between suppliers and manufacturers. Secondly, legal and IT security teams are going to need to work together on this. The road between the legal slash compliance function and IT security is not, in my experience at least, necessarily always a well-trodden path in some organisations. Simply reproducing an existing IT security policy, even if one exists, is going to be unlikely to cut it here either. So hopefully, this presents an opportunity for both teams to get to know each other a bit better. And can we have the next slide, please, um, for Mark? Super. Um, thanks, Charlie. Um, Charlie alluded to the, 
team sport there uh, that, that this kind of endeavor is. And, and we've got this question mark, can, can we find any parallels with GDPR? What, what did we learn uh, from GDPR that might be useful to us here? It, it's of course a consideration in its own right in, in, in this context, but that's, that's not what I'm looking at just over the next couple of minutes. So I've just put up on the, the slide as just a table of, of those areas where there's some commonality and one or two at the bottom where there isn't um, between the, the guidance on cybersecurity and, and, and GDPR. Some of you will notice that's of course not quite comparing like with like. We started off with trying to find parallels. We thought about the question of priorities and, and what you prioritize in a program of this sort um, because that seems to us the hallmark of projects that are uh, effective and successful um, from those that are less so. So you've got a principles-based approach across both of these fields so that they have these high-level um, concepts secure by design or the GDPR equivalent of, of, of privacy by design and by default um, at the heart of them an organizational measure in the form of a risk assessment which is tailored for your organization all good stuff um, with the advantage that it gives you flexibility in terms of how you how you operate but something of a disadvantage given the amount of detail that is in effect left to the regulated entity to work out for themselves um, so in terms of priority and and prioritizing um, areas we, we, we thought about some of the other parallels with GDPR that, that one of the obvious ones is is the documenting of processes but both this seems to be a, 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 a kind of key feature of, of modern legislation and it, the MDCG guidance albeit it's non-binding as Alex pointed out is no exception to that it contains as we counted them um, well over a dozen references to the requirement to document your security measures or the accompanying risk assessment and, and by document there um, that's not to be confused with a requirement for a specific type of documentation itself, most obviously in the form of the instructions for use or, or other technical documentation that's mentioned in the guidance, but just the documenting of your actual processes. I think the key message here is a very simple one. What we saw in GDPR where we found projects that were effective, what they started with was spending more of their time and resource on, on the substance of, of what those processes should be what a good process should look like and much less on documenting them documenting them is one thing and you need that evidence trail um, as much as anything for when the nose guide body comes knocking but the hard bit of the project is embedding those processes into your business so in the gdpr example perhaps the simplest one which would be i hope familiar to everyone uh, until um, GDPR, there was no statutory requirement in Europe to report personal data breaches, um, that there hadn't previously existed such a requirement except in one or two member states. So understandably, most organizations had an informal approach to that. Um, and it was all about creating a new process to ensure the staff could recognize an incident, uh, that they knew how to report it, uh, and that the organization itself understood it, it's its legal responsibility in terms of um, how that needed to be reported either to a data protection authority and or to affected individuals. But the underlying process is the important bit um, to spend the time on, not the documenting of it. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit about technical and organizational measures. Um, if we could have the next slide, because it might be easier to do it from that one. Um, this is a familiar concept again across both fields. Uh, it drives a number of articles across GDPR, but it's interesting that the MDCG guidance has used the same terminology, albeit much less directively. So, so in the section on minimum IT requirements, chapter 3.6 of the, of the MDCG guidance, it simply asserts in relation to IT security measures for the, for the operating environment, the relevant security requirements may include any combination of technical and organizational measures that affect the IT security of the operating environment of the medical device. And it, and it then goes on to provide an indicative list of those requirements. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but it makes quite clear that the exact requirements are there to be 
defined by the manufacturer case by case. It's not all security measures are going to be systematically applicable in all contexts. That is the kind of guidance that makes these guidance documents long, but without really illuminating the subject matter much. Um, the concept, however, uh, comes out a little better in that table in the annex that I referred to on pages 36 to 38 of the guidance, which, which does actually repay some careful study. Um, so this concept of technical and organizational measures um, is one that is familiar to us, and the associated concept of the continuing assessment of whether the security measures are state of the art, that's, that's Article 84 of the medical device regulations, and, and part of uh, uh, you know, the thread of the guidance itself, it is one that's familiar to us. Um, a different and less familiar example, once we started looking at it, was what I've called incident reporting, um, where in fact we found that the terminology and the guidance was quite confusing, but it gave us an important discovery. As I put in the question there, what's the difference between security events and security incident reporting? Well, I, I think Dan uh, alluded to this um, in his um, discussion about reasonably foreseeable misuse. The, the way in which the guidance actually, uh, this I'm referring to the section where Dan was talking about vulnerability reports from um, coming from, from a variety of, of public sources and, and the importance of having procedures to handle those coming in to the organization so that you can recognize them, understand their significance and, and take measures to act on them. When we started looking at the guidance, we were initially confused as to why uh, there was reference to security events when th there's a perfectly good statutory definition of an incident uh, or of a serious incident. Uh, and how is this all different from security incident reporting? Well, you'll see in that yellow lozenge on the slide, it says, you know, the operator should ensure that security is maintained during the operation and application of the system and particularly not compromised by changes in the environment or by user interaction and, and should notify the manufacturer without delay of any suspected security event. That is very much broader than the concept of incident reporting. So that comes in the basic cybersecurity concepts in section 262. And as far as we can tell, it, it is very much a deliberate use of terminology. And, and the answer is, is tucked away in chapter four, which is all about documentation and instructions for use where it says manufacturers must provide healthcare providers a description of how the design enables the device to announce when an anomalous conditions are detected, i.e. security events, and then you get some light, configuration changes, network anomalies, login attempts, and anom anomalous traffic, for example, send requests to unknown entities. So the concept of security event intel sharing is very much broader uh, than the concept of, of a security incident report here. And we're not sure from a contractual perspective as between the parties, whether that's an area to go light touch or whether it will become a, a somewhat more detailed interaction uh, between the parties. That leads me to the last comment I was gonna make before I hand back to Charlie, um, which is one of the things conspicuously different uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, as between GDPR and the guidance we have today, is the absence of any um, mandatory requirement for, for contracts. I touched on it earlier. It's been quite helpful, hasn't it, in GDPR to have a statutory baseline scope for the issues that need to be covered and the contractual allocation of responsibilities between the parties. It, it has narrowed the scope of, of what's actually difficult. Now that's not to say that those um, provisions don't continue to be negotiated by parties to an agreement, but actually what are the two things that's been holding us up, generally speaking, in a GDPR context? They're not the compliance requirements at all, they're liability, which is not a requirement of the law but a commercial issue. Charlie will just touch on that. Uh, and the other one, I called it operational niceties, I, I mean the opposite, the fundamental principles like who's the controller, 
um, and who's the processor in that example that I'm using. Those are the things that have held us up in negotiating GDPR uh, under GDPR contracts between controllers and processors. So it does seem to us quite an omission from this guidance that there is almost absolute freedom to contract for the parties to this guidance. And we think that that is the message. Spending some time just tracing through your priorities for which of the areas to spend time on, uh, both downstream and to some extent also upstream, will be time well spent. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Mark. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the obligations relating to post-market surveillance and the guidance are a good example of where it would have been helpful for the guidance to be a little, or indeed a lot more, prescriptive and detailed as to the actual contractual terms that it would expect to see. Um, page 28 of the guidance gives us this just on the slide of what should be included in a, quote, effective and successful post-market post cybersecurity surveillance program. You'll see these are set at a quite high level. Uh, they beg a number of questions um, from my point of view when deciding how to implement them as contractual obligations. Um, for example, sharing and dissemination of information and knowledge. What really is the scope of this obligation? How serious would the threat or vulnerability have to be for it to be shared with other stakeholders? What about scenarios where sharing of knowledge of a threat or vulnerability could put the party sharing in breach of a contractual or statutory obligation? For example, a component supplier might receive information from one customer of a vulnerability in their product. But by disclosing that information to other customers, might the supplier be in breach of confidentiality obligations under its contract to the first customer? One could approach this by a carve-out in the confidentiality provisions to allow sharing of knowledge of vulnerabilities and threats in order to comply with regulatory guidance, perhaps with the prior approval of the customer that shares the information. Vulnerability remediation. This implies the assistance of stakeholders, most obviously operators and healthcare providers, in mitigating or fixing a vulnerability or threat. Section 3.8 of the guidance gives examples of imp implementing patches or making changes to network configuration. These are obvious examples that seem relatively easy and inexpensive to implement. But what if this isn't always the case? What should the extent of the obligation be? How quickly should the counterparty carry out the mitigation? What should the consequences be if the stakeholder doesn't take the requested action and the vulnerability is exploited by an attacker and the manufacturer suffers losses as a result? And looking at incident response, this raises immediate questions around scope and cost. The kind of activities that a manufacturer might expect an operator to carry out to help it respond to a serious incident could be significant and costly. What should the scope of the assistance be? What criteria could be used to determine the demarcation point between the supplier's business as usual activities and work above and beyond this that the supplier might expect a charge for? All these are the kinds of issues that we'd expect manufacturers and suppliers and other stakeholders to have to work through in the coming months and years. So many, ma many manufacturers have been looking over their quality agreements and contracts with suppliers and other stakeholders in the supply chain in preparation for MDR. The reality is the guidance means you're going to have to open them all up again to include the new cybersecurity obligations, or at least that's our view. I expect manufacturers will find that many stakeholders will be ready, at least in principle, to agree to new cybersecurity requirements given what the guidance says about joint responsibility and that much of what it contains reflects existing good market practice for cybersecurity hygiene. But what about the commercial and other legal implications of including the new obligations? After all, a supplier or other stakeholder could argue that the new provisions have the effect of increasing their liability exposure and that the nature of cybersecurity risk is that it's a dangerous combination of risks that are difficult to get complete control over, coupled with the potential to give rise to staggeringly large losses and reputational damage. The Equifax and Sony breaches spring to mind. From the manufacturer's point of view, they're going to want, wherever possible, 
to ensure that should the supplier breach the new cybersecurity obligations and the manufacturer incurs losses as a result of the breach, that they in principle could recover the losses or at least a sizable proportion of them from the supplier. So a good outcome from the point of view of the manufacturer is going to be ensuring that a breach of the cybersecurity obligations by the supplier isn't subject to a low liability cap in the contract and that the kind of losses that the manufacturer would incur as a result of a data breach are expressly carved out of the exclusion of indirect losses that are a common feature of a limitation of liability clause. One way of achieving this without signalling intent to the supplier would be to carve out losses arising from regulatory breaches from the limitations and exclusions of liability altogether, in the same way that losses arising from breaches of confidentiality and third-party IPR indemnities often are. So the supplier would have to accept that were it to breach applicable law, then there would be no contractual limit to the losses that the manufacturer would seek to recover from it. But for this to work in relation to the guidance, the definition of applicable law in the contract would have to expressly include regulatory guidance and not just refer to legislation and binding legal decisions or instruments. On the other hand, a supplier that is alive to the risk might be expected to fight quite hard not to accept uncapped liability for a breach of their cybersecurity obligations and to define those obligations as tightly as possible. But painful as this tug of war is probably going to be, our advice would be for manufacturers to stick with it. Much of what the guidance requires are things that a good supplier should be doing anyway. The manufacturer should expect the supplier to stand by their contractual commitments by accepting liability if it breaches them. And ultimately, it is likely to be the manufacturer that faces the greater losses flowing from a breach. What could a compromise position look like? In the wake of the dramatically increased fines introduced by the GDPR, we saw a trend in the more elaborate and higher value data processing agreements for parties to agree specific separate caps just for breaches of the data protection provisions. These super caps are higher than the standard liability cap and also apply to any claims brought under an indemnity. They can mean that a supplier is not looking down the barrel of potentially unlimited liability and that a manufacturer has some confidence that if the worst case scenario materialized in terms of a cyber breach, it could in theory recover at least a sizable chunk of its losses. An important advantage of this kind of super cap is that it could be covered by a cybersecurity insurance policy. These have become more common as a solution to the problem of, of allocating risk for data protection breaches and could also play a role here. But in our experience, making a cybersecurity insurance policy solution work in practice rather than just look good on paper takes a lot of detailed work by both parties and often in means uh, direct engagement between uh, the insurance brokers from each side. So these are all very deep waters, legally speaking. We could spend much longer discussing types of loss, caps, exclusions, carve-outs and indemnities, or other contractual issues like the relationship between, between a cybersecurity breach and a breach of confidentiality. And if anyone listening wants a more focused session, we'd be happy to provide it. But hopefully this gives you a sense of how the parties might approach risk allocation and at least one possible compromise solution. And I'll hand over to uh, Andrew here. Thank you, Charlie. We've seen some of the problems facing medical device cybersecurity earlier in the webinar. We've looked at uh, different scenarios, for example, attacks on supply chains and, and denial of service via, via ransomware. Uh, but let's Let's look at some potential solutions. Across the medical device ecosystem, there are different security requirements to take into consideration. These requirements are derived from operation security, IT and information communication security, operational technology security, OT security. The Internet of Medical Things security, Internet of Things and Industrial Internet of Things security, so which are those five uh, columns that you can see there. Now, whilst that list may seem a little daunting, it's worth remembering that the buzzwords, despite the buzzwords, cybersecurity principles and practices are common across different industries. So they apply here too. 
of course, priorities may vary. Some industries are going to, availability is going to be more important than confidentiality and vice versa. But nevertheless, uh, security principles remain fundamentally the same. At a high level, Aon's proposed solution to solving the security requirements of medical device cybersecurity is a five layer model that you can see here with each layer feeding into the one above it. The first two layers are governance driven with data privacy and governance as a foundation, followed by risk management and compliance. We can then start to move into more technical requirements such as security architecture, security testing, and incident response. And taken together, this is Aon's uh, high level solution to medical device security. I'm going to take each of these in, in, in turn uh, and talk a little bit more about them to hopefully give you a, a better understanding of what we have in mind. Uh, obviously, GDPR has already been, been covered, so um, I don't want to dwell on that too much. Um, Looking at compliance, clearly the compliance requirement that we're most interested in here is, is the MDCG cybersecurity guidance, uh, the webinar itself. So I'd like to tie that uh, into Aon's solution. Uh, if we refer to the, to the cybersecurity guidance itself, uh, section three is secure design and manufacture. One of the most critical images in the whole document is the risk management process, and this is found on page 17, uh, figure six, and it's entitled Information Flow in Safety and Security Risk Management for Medical Devices. This sets out a risk management process that should be part of the entire life cycle of the device, essentially to ensure a secure product life cycle. Uh, and, and this includes risk management, risk assessment and risk control, then going into overall risk, uh, residual risk, uh, and then review. Uh, and then interestingly to, to post market surveillance and vigilance. Uh, so reviewing information on the relevance for safety and taking access, uh, taking control where, where required. So more risk control, um, recalling the product if necessary, uh, and so on. So that, that, that life cycle covers the, the, the whole product. Now, I'd say that the key stages for medical device manufacture are design and manufacture as this sets the foundation of security. So I'd like to focus briefly on the, the first subsection of section three, which is entitled Secure by Design. Now, uh, Mark previously mentioned uh, privacy by design and security by design is, uh, of course, analogous. And essentially, we're trying to uh, embed security throughout the whole life cycle uh, so that from the ground up uh, the, the product is secure it's it's not thought of as an afterthought uh, but it is actually an intrinsic to the properties of the product and and you know, really you're not going to get a, a properly secure device otherwise uh, and as i said these principles cut across different industries so it's it's similar for, for products in in other industries um, but clearly there are specific uh, implications here with medical products in terms of, of people's health and life itself. Once the risk management framework I've just described is in place uh, to operate within, then the first stage for developing a new medical device securely is following common eight practices uh, to develop a defense in depth approach. Uh, and this is in, in from the document itself. I just talked brief about defense in depth. I mean, this means having multiple security controls that are usually layered uh, to avoid uh, any single point of failure. Uh, but if one does fail, then there are other controls that can uh, to help pick up the slack, if you like, uh, and potentially mitigate risk further. Uh, so the, the eight the eight practices are security management, specification of security requirements, secure by design, secure implementation, security verification and validation testing, management of security related issues, security management update, and security uh, security guidelines. So sticking still within this kind of middle tier of security architecture and and, and management. 
Um, Matt previously mentioned threat modeling, uh, and this is a kind of key part of the risk assessment process because they help identify scenarios which may be mitigated by security controls. So jumping ahead of myself slightly, but there are, there are other things like uh, code, code security tests that you can do to, to check it, the code, but you will need to be thinking about covering all your bases. So you can have penetration testing and you can have code reviews, but there are things that can be missed by either automated testing or, or even manual testing. And threat modeling is a good way of, of trying to cover architectural flaws. So it's, it's a, a, key, a key part of this. To talk about the next layer up in terms of security testing, I've, I've mentioned you know, some, some of the things that, that, uh, that should, should go on there, like, like code review, for example. Uh, but there is also fuzz testing, uh, where the inputs uh, to a device are, are, are tested. Usually you use some automated tool to, to throw a lot of, of, of data, mis, uh, misformed data, malformed data uh, at the inputs to see uh, if, if they fall over. Because uh, quite often in the design process, things are designed uh, to work and if it doesn't work, but it falls over, you know, in the, in the worst case scenario. So you need, you need to, to design securely, as we said before, uh, security by design, uh, secure by design, uh, but then also you need to test. It's all very well kind of the theory, but the practice needs to, needs to be done to check that that works too. Uh, penetration testing, uh, different, different types of, of that that can be done. Uh, you know, we've got here across the top, IT security and OT security, so there's penetration testing uh, in many of those areas. And probably worth talking about some of the kind of automated tools that are, that are used now in, in the industry. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are companies out there who are working in this space with some really quite exciting uh, technologies. Um, we've got some, we were talking to a, to a, a company in Ireland uh, who were looking at the securing the kind of the design process uh, of the devices and then we've got another company that that's will be testing uh, devices in situ once they've actually been up and up and running finally we've got instant response and this is if something goes wrong so we've mentioned data breaches for example um, and of course you know the impact of that in the medical space is uh, potentially catastrophic uh, also we've seen uh, with with WannaCry for example uh, actual ransomware attacks that, that have uh, crippled um, medical facilities, uh, including large parts of the NHS. Uh, so they're there for real. So you need to have as part of the security uh, process, the ability to react to incidents. Uh, and you know, this requires planning uh, and, and testing of the plans to make sure that it works. Now, we know that the skills required to design, build, test and support uh, all these systems, you know, vary to that of someone capable of doing the same for an OT system. So IT and OT, uh, you know, there are similarities, there is overlap, but they're not quite the same thing. So, so there is the need to develop specific skills uh, in in the IOMT space, in, in particular. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that the need for those skills is that, you know, from from Aon's point of view, those those are skill sets uh, that we have ac across the board, uh, and you know, we we feel that we can deliver um, security in a, in a connected way uh, that works uh, really very well in, in the medical device security space. Thank you very much. Um, we've got one question, I apologize, we've kind of run out of time, but, but we've got one question about to what extent do you think it will be necessary to update QAs and IFUs to accommodate cybersecurity? A good example of that would be Let's assume, as I think most large uh, connected medical device manufacturers are likely to do, let's assume that you're going to use penetration testing as part of your cybersecurity assessment. And in my view, it is very apparent from the guidance that the Commission anticipates that you will be doing regular penetration testing. Uh, a very it, relatively few quality agreements that I see include explicit provisions that would enable the manufacturer to impose either upstream or downstream the uh, the obligation to cooperate with an Aon 
if you were to engage an Aon to come and do some penetration testing. And that's just a small example. The other examples that Mark pointed out on his particular slide with the yellow and orange lozenges on the page, the distinction between security events and incident reporting. Um, if you haven't specified that you expect that from the end user in your IFU or similar document, then I don't see how you're taking advantage of the joint slash shared responsibility opportunity set out in the guidance. So I would be startled if many quality agreements address these requirements in the level of detail that a notified body or a regulator or an ISO auditor is likely to expect from you. So that's why we think it's likely that many people will revisit their uh, quality agreements and IFUs to address these requirements. But someone's asked a great question, which is how to make a product secure by design <laughs> with difficulty. Partly it's about mapping, partly it's those points that Aon was mentioning on that final slide doing a mapping exercise, trying to revisit the, uh, the systems from time to time. Medical device systems do not need to be perfectly secure, they need to be appropriately secure. And the risk benefit analysis is accepted in the guidance. I apologize, sorry. Um, Aon, did you want to jump in or uh, Mark or Charlie, did you want to jump in on anything in relation to updating QAs, IFUs, or the nice broad question, how to make a product secure by design? Hi, Max, it's, it's Charlie. I, I, you know, direct the questioner to pages 15 and 16 of the guidance where if you haven't seen it, there is uh, some detail on the uh, coordinating groups thinking about what they mean by secure, secure by design. Yeah, if, if um, it's Andrew here, if, if, if I can chip, chip in on that. I mean, essentially we're talking about from designing from, from the ground up. So that means when you are devising a product, when you have the product roadmap, right at the, right at the start, when, you, when you're looking at what the product needs to be doing, you know, from a, not just, you know, we obviously got the medical requirements, but at that point you should also be including the security requirements. Uh, does does it have any? You need to now analyze what you're going to be doing with it. So those security requirements are the kind of the kind of main main areas to 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 to, to start with, and you can feed into those from uh, compliance requirements as well, like GDPR, for example. It really depends on 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 what it was is it's, it's going to be doing. You know, is it is it secure? Is it uh, does it have any any confidential information in there, for example? Uh, if it does, then you have to design to keep. That information confidential. The the the, the reason this is, is kind of mentioned, I think, is that is that quite often, software in particular has been has been written kind of on the go, on on the hoof, um, uh, and you know security has been a, a, an afterthought, and it's proven very difficult to be able to uh, secure something after the fact. I mean, if 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 not if if not impossible, um, you know, it's always better to treat take security throughout the whole the whole life cycle of a product uh, and if you do that you know you have you have a better chance uh, of of making it secure uh, and also making it uh, demonstrably secure because if if you have your security requirements and if you define them carefully you know that you can then test them uh, and then uh, if that then gives you ability to 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 verify that the requirements have been met uh, and that that then can feed into into the compliance uh, requirements as well, because then, for example, you know, we talked about penetration testing. You now, that 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 can be one of the uh, compliance requirements, and so if that's met, um, you know, then you've done your job. Um, worth worthwhile also saying that you know it's it's not, you know, once it's done, it's not finished. I mean, it's it's always going to be something that you're going to look at continually, uh, because you know, uh, vulnerabilities evolve effectively. You know, you might be using open source software, for example, and all of a sudden the vulnerability is found in that and made public. Now, if you haven't designed for that, then the chances are that your product is going to be uh, vulnerable straight off the bat, uh, and it'll effectively be a zero day for uh, for that product. If, however, you've used you know, secure by design principle, uh, and then that in turn re requires defense in depth strategy, you know, you've got a better chance of surviving an attack like that.
um, un unscathed, or at least you know, reducing the risk of a se severe impact. All right, this is Alex. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, I really appreciate your time. Uh, and on behalf of Aon, thanks again for uh, joining. Uh, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact any of us and we'll do what we can to send you through uh, some answers. Um, I don't know that we've given you many silver bullet answers, but I think we've tried to show you a roadmap as we see the way forward and using some learnings from, uh, from other areas. But thank you all very much. Um, uh, I hope you have a very good evening.